My name is Susan Fowler Jameson. My birth name is Fowler and I had that until I moved to America in 1980 and married Harold Jameson. So some of you may know me as Fowler and some of you may know me as Jameson. When I was asked to tell my story, I thought about it a lot and my first thought was, my story is not very interesting. I don't have an interesting story. I don't have Baba coming into my dream and telling me to wake up. Um, I didn't have God speaks fall on my head. It was more a gradual awakening for me. And I, I was thinking about how extraordinary it is that Maya Baba has orchestrated all of our individual lives to get to the point where we hear his name. It's a miracle for all of us. It's simply extraordinary to recognize him in this life. It's, it's a miracle for all of us. So here I am. I feel privileged to be able to tell you my story. I suppose the course of my life was set as a child when I would go into our backyard in Brisbane as a little girl and converse with the fairies. We had fairies in our garden and I didn't think that that was anything unusual at all to talk to the fairies. They let me be there and observe them. It was, it was lovely and I didn't tell anybody because I thought it was what happened to everybody when you're a child, what happens in your life is what you think happens in life. So I didn't say anything to anybody. The other thing I would do would lie on the grass in our backyard and look up at the sky. And even without knowing about God or learning the names, because I was very young, I just knew that there was more to this physical world <clears throat> than what we were living in. So that was my childhood. It was very magical. It was lovely. I had a, a wonderful set of parents. So that was, that was lovely. Uh, grew up with lots of love. When, I don't know what age I was, but um, our parents, and I, I say our parents, my parents decided that we needed some religious instruction in our life. Um, my dad did not believe in God and my mum was a very spiritual person without naming that as spirituality. So they decided that we, and I say we, but it was really me because my brothers weren't born yet. We went to the Presbyterian church which was around the corner from our house. That was chosen literally because of that fact. It was around the corner of our house. Nobody had cars that I knew at that time. This was in the early 50s, early mid 50s. It, the economy was just coming back from the war. So not a lot of wealth. We were all in the same socioeconomic uh, level, which was not poor, not rich, somewhere between low and mid. All of our friends were in that same um, class, so to speak. So I started going to the church, the Presbyterian church, which was awfully dull. It was very staid, it was very conservative. But I didn't realize that as a child. It was a lot of fun. I had so much fun did all the extra curriculum things, Sunday school, uh, learn about Jesus. I heard Jesus' name and I thought he was pretty cool. Um, did gymnastics, uh, took part in a Steadfords, reading Bible passages, and I got quite good at that. Uh, joined the choir, sang in the choir, and it was really lots of fun and that became my young childhood life. But I started to question or just look around me when I was in my early teens, 12, 13, 
and realized it was so one dimensional. He was, he was God, the almighty God, and his son Jesus, who was a really cool guy, and, but his dad, God, was even much cooler because he could do all kinds of amazing things punish people, talk to people without them knowing he was talking to them and make them do all kinds of things. Uh, then there was his son Jesus who was also a really good guy and Jesus had all these friends who followed him around and really liked him and some of them weren't so good, you know, the cross and all of that. Um, and then there was, so this is how we were taught, there was a hierarchy, there was God, and next to God was the angels. Uh, and I knew that they were talking about another realm, even though that wasn't taught to us. And the angels were really pretty and they had wings. I wasn't sure quite what the angels did. We weren't really taught that, but I knew that they were around at Christmas time and they herald, they herald in Christmas. So we had God, we had the angels, we had Jesus who liked his father, they got on really well. Superheroes, total, total super guys. And then Jesus had all his friends, all his followers, and then there was the rest of us. And we were meant to do whatever Jesus said, and Jesus did whatever his father said. And it was all very one-dimensional, and that just did not seem right to me. I knew that there was more, more to that. Um, eventually when I was around oh, 14, I just stopped going to church. It wasn't doing it for me. I had started uh, becoming a teenager and looking outwards, questioning things, rebelling slightly. Uh, re rebellion at that time, at that age for me, was wanting to wear jeans. And my father would not allow girls to wear pants. Girls did not wear pants girls wore skirts and dresses. And I remember having a huge fight with my dad about wanting a pair of jeans with a zip up the front. And um, that, that was a battle, but I eventually got my jeans with the zip. <laughs> so after that, as I said, I started to, to look around me and uh, Went to high school, left high school when I was 15. I just wanted to get the hell out of there. And I had this restlessness that I wanted to, to, I was looking for something. I wasn't sure what it was. And I just wanted to get out and search for it. So I would hitchhike down to the Gold Coast, uh, speaking here from Queensland. Uh, I grew up in Brisbane, so there's the Gold Coast down the south and the Sunshine Coast in the north, which is where we are now. <clears throat> and at that time, uh, hitchhiking was a very accepted form of transportation. It, it just was. You would just go out on the road, put out your, your thumb, and you would be taken where you wanted to go. And my dad would even drive me to the highway and drop me off to hitchhike. Unconditional love. My dad loved me very much and it was just totally unconditional. And he trusted me and I honored that trust and loyalty. So I'm mentioning this because an incident happened when I was hitchhiking. Um, a ute pulled up, for those of you who don't know, a ute is a, a, is a small truck. And two men were in the front, one got out, and I got in the middle of these two men. And we were driving, and I started to get slightly uncomfortable. These men started to say things about me, flattering things and things, other things that weren't so nice. And I started to get rather uncomfortable. and. I started to think, how am I going to get out of this situation? I'm in between two men and I was basically a situation that I couldn't get out of. One, the man that wasn't driving started to put his arm around me and at that very instant, a rock or a stone flew into the windscreen and totally shattered it. 
there was no gravel around, there was no, no where that you could even imagine that that would happen. It did, the windscreen just exploded and of course they cursed and as one would and drove to the nearest service station which happened to be very close and I was able to leave. And I knew that I was being taken care of. I just absolutely knew that, that someone was looking after me and of course I know now who that was. And there was other instances in my life where that happened also where I was um, held, held by something that I couldn't explain, but I was very protected. So fast forward a little bit. <clears throat> um, moved up here to the Sunshine Coast. Uh, I, was about, I left home when I was about 17 not because of, of a bad situation at home, but as I explained, I just wanted to get out. I had this restlessness, just wanted to find out what was going on. Moved up here to the Sunshine Coast. In those days, in the early 70s, it, it, the whole world was in like a fever. Um, there was some, lots of energy going on. There was young people searching. There was lots of new things happening in the world. Uh, the, the breaking down of the old, the conservative ways were starting to break down. And the Sunshine Coast here, down the beach, there was a lot of alternative things that were happening. There was everything you could think of. There was the beach, which has always been a little alternative and attracts certain people. There was the surfy culture, there was the hippie culture. Um, I was a mixture of both. <laughs> you had vegetarianism, you had macrobiotics, you had permaculture, before it was called permaculture, we just called it growing your own food. Um, there was all kinds of spirituality or pseudo-spirituality from uh, transcendental meditation, transcendental meditation, the Krishnas were here, uh, there was all kinds of alternative Christianity. Um, gosh, there was everything to explore if you wanted to. Uh, tons of yoga, uh, Buddhism, Taoism, this, that, so you could just dabble in whatever you wanted to, and I did. I dipped my toe in all kinds of things. Nothing felt right. And somehow along the way, I don't even remember how or where this came from, but I was given a copy of Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda. And I read that book, I devoured that book, and that book really changed my life. Someone's talking about reincarnation, like that made so much sense. Someone's talking about consequences of your actions. That made sense. Just the whole and the way he describes spirituality and um, it just made total sense to me and I'm forever grateful for reading, reading that book. Uh, so th there, there I was living down the coast, um, smoking dope, uh, into, into the kind of drugs that were around at that time, which was basically marijuana and magic mushrooms. We didn't have the money for anything else and there wasn't any hard drugs around. Um, I remember going very early in the morning down to the cow paddocks in Sippy Downs, which is now <clears throat> a housing estate, lots of housing estates, and picking the magic mushrooms. And um, had many, many happy, fun times but it really wasn't my scene. I followed what everybody else did, but I never felt comfortable in that altered consciousness. I didn't like it. I wanted to be get down, be straight again. Um, but you did what your peers did. And so life went on. It was really a fun time. Uh, lots of beaching, lots of drugs, lots of friends, but at the same time, we were all waiting for the next phase of our lives to happen. 
And as things do, um, there was a yoga convention, and I say convention, it's not convention in the terms that we would think of a convention now. It was really a happening, a yoga happening. And it was down in Malulaba, uh, Malulaba Beach, and I went to it because that's what you did. And I did yoga then, and there was a lot, a lot of people, um, people, beautiful people, beautiful people. And uh, I remember just being there and walking around <clears throat> and taking the classes. And a woman started to walk towards me and I was walking towards her and our eyes locked. It was like magnets. And we started talking as you did in those days. You just talked to everybody. You, it's what you did. They were your brother, they were your sister. And we started talking and that woman was Liz Gaskin. Uh, her name was Liz Hine for a while and now she's Liz Gaskin again. And we talked and talked and talked and she told me about Maya Baba. I can't remember what her actual words were or in what context she said. I just remember her saying his name and telling me that there was meetings that I could attend if I wanted to. And I wanted to because I was looking, I was grabbing at all kinds of things. So uh, the next night or the next week, I can't remember the time frame, I came to my first barber meeting, which was at Norman and Hazel Shipways Farm, which is, was down the track on the bush down from Avatar's abode. I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know that Avatar's abode existed. Um, I went to the farm, to the meeting, it was uh, very uh, rural. The Shipways were very, very simple people. The house was a very simple farmhouse. And I walked into the house and in the lounge room were a group of people. And they were the, I thought at that time I was 20. I was 20. Um, it was 70, it was 1972, so I was 21, 21 that year. And for my young age, I walked in and these people were very odd. They were very, very odd group of people. And they were really old. I mean, they must have been 40 if, if a day. And I looked around and it was exciting. It was an exciting thing seeing this odd group of people and wondering what and who they were. That group of people ended up being uh, Lorna and Robert Rouse, who were a very bohemian couple who had come up at Barber's orders to live on Avatar's abode. Um, and it's now called the original farmhouse. So they were there, very bohemian looking. Uh, there was also Norm and Hazel Shipway, who were very simple farm people, very Australian, very Queensland, very simple. Um, there was a couple of younger people at that time. I learnt their names later, of course. There was John Isaacs, who was at that time going through his must phase and he was in a corner wrapped in a blanket with really, really, really long hair. Uh, and so it must have been winter because he had a blanket wrapped around him. So it must have been June of 1972. I don't remember who else with, was there and I know that there was some other younger people there. The, the one person that stood out in my mind was a little man who was seated by himself who was obviously 
the leader without saying he was the leader. And I knew this without anybody telling me. He was small, he had very with wispy hair, he was sitting cross-legged and he looked like a sage or a seer. And the meeting consisted, I was welcomed very warmly, the meeting consisted of reading two books. Uh, one, the first selection was a spiritual themed book such as the Ramayana or Leila and Majnun or Monkey and I didn't know any of this, what these books were about. Um, the second book that we read was a barber book, a published barber book. In those days there wasn't very many published barber books. There was Beams, there was the Everything and the Nothing, the Discourses and God Speaks and I think that was pretty much it. So the first book, the spiritually themed book, uh, it could have been, I can't remember what it was, I think it might have been later in Majnun, was passed around the room and every person read one or two paragraphs. I was comfortable with this, I was a good reader, I felt comfortable with a group of people reading, so it, that wasn't an issue for me. So it would go around the room and each person would read a little bit and pass it on. There was no questions asked of the content in the book, but if there was any comment made, it was made by this man, who of course was Francis Brabazon. I later found out. He would comment on a word uh, that perhaps no one understood, an Indian sounding word, uh, or comment on the nature of the sentence that had been read and I found that I was very I was rather impressed by his knowledge. Uh, then we would read a the Baba book and the same thing it would be passed around the room. I had no idea what I was reading some of the words were incredibly foreign to me um, so I, I read, but I had no idea what I was reading. I had no idea what the whole me meeting was about, <laughs> really. <laughs> uh, no one said Maya Baba's name. Um, in the everything and the nothing, Baba's name would come up, uh, but it was mainly the words were he or with a capital H or um, him. But I understood that it was about Maya Baba, the meeting. After the meeting was over, we would have tea and biscuits and informal chatting. And everybody was very warm. I felt very welcomed. And something kept drawing me in and back to more meetings. The series of events, I, I, I can't tell you because time has erased that. But from that time, from that time, I started to be very, very deeply interested in what Maya Baba had to say about spirituality. I got a copy of the discourses and started reading them, and everything that Maya Baba said made absolute sense to me. It's like, oh, finally, someone is explaining everything that I ever wanted to know, every question I ever had about spirituality, um, what happens after you die, uh, uh, ev everything, everything he answered. And it wasn't like, yes, you are God. It was, it was more, wow, finally someone has answered all of these questions that I've wanted to ask someone about. Uh, so that, that just felt brilliant. I started to leave my friends down, down, down the beach and the coast because I wasn't interested in what they were doing anymore. I wasn't interested in smoking dope. I wasn't interested in that whole scene which seemed to be very 
um, very ephemeral and very silly in a way. I obviously came to Avatar's abode and met Francis and just started to move <laughs> move closer and closer to Avatar's abode and got, got to know the local people and the barber lovers around this area. Um, and it wasn't like a thunderbolt for me. It was never, it was never, he is God. He is absolutely God. It never happened that way. I didn't worry about that. I was just enjoying this knowledge that I had and this new concept that perhaps there was somebody other than Jesus or who was Jesus, because I was very, I like Jesus a lot. Um, this concept that there was somebody who was Jesus, perhaps he really was Jesus. Could he be Jesus come again? How does that work? I had all of these questions and as I said, Maya Baba answered all of those questions. And one thing I remember, I was in a car and it must have been with Lorna and perhaps Diana Snow and we were driving to a barber meeting somewhere and I remember seeing Baba's image, Baba's face everywhere in the trees, on the lamp posts, on the electrical wires. And I said, oh look, Baba's face, can you see it? Look, Baba's face is everywhere. And I remember now this side glance they gave each other. And now I know what that side glance was. Oh man, she's gone, she's a goner. <laughs> <laughs> and it was quite extraordinary just seeing Baba's face everywhere. And I loved the older Baba lovers that I met. Marge Donaldson was, was uh, just, just lovely. Uh, Judith Garbutt, uh, Diana Snow, uh, Lorna, uh, May Lundquist, uh, goodness, I hope I'm not forgetting anybody, but they became uh, really n not mentors, but ways to be a woman, ways that I could see how you could be a woman and love God. Whether God was Maya Baba at that time, I didn't know. I still wasn't convinced that he's God, because that's pretty huge. I mean, a man being God, I, I still had that, that one-dimensional God is in heaven, what is heaven, but he's there looking down upon you and, and dispelling <laughs> gifts or, or boons upon his people. So to come to this concept that there could be a man who I just missed, he was on earth, that was God, that was a bit of a leap that I still had to make. But his everything he said, everything I read, it made sense. And I wasn't doubting any of that. It was just that huge leap from, is he God? What is, how does that work? I didn't know. But I questioned that a lot. And um, as I said, being around these wonderful women was great, but particularly being around Francis Brabazon. Francis was the epitome of how to love God. He was the most humble person I have, I could ever, ever meet. His way of just being and loving God is an example for, for everybody. His steadfastness in that love his conviction in that love uh, just is, is, was so influential in my life. I would like to, uh, if I could, read something from In Dust I Sing, which is the beginning and the end of 
one's love and one's finding God. <clears throat> Sils Guzzle 72 from In Dust I Sing by Francis Brabazon. And this is how I feel. Sils Guzzle 108. When the wheel of fortune stopped at my number, I did not ask another turn. It had completed its billion years task. When, on that billionth year night, love came to me, I did not seek another brow of dreams and honeyed mouth and petal cheek. I fear that faithfulness will be the cause of my undoing. In this dark night, I cannot be comforted by other wooing. Even now, I am as an ant under a horse's hoof, a safe enough place, but one from which I cannot move. When our house is destroyed, it's certain that we'll re we will remain living. Why don't men grasp this simple truth and put an end to grieving? Astronomies and agriculturalists Ac accomplishment is in proving that under no circumstances can death quit one of loving. The wheel of fortune may turn, as in my case, for a billion years before it stops at your number and your true beloved appears. So I really felt, I still feel, that through millions and millions of lives, it brought me to this point of recognizing his name in this life. And I am eternally grateful to Maya Baba for that. But as Francis says over and over in In Dust I Sing and all of his other wonderful poetry and works, now, now the work begins. So we've found him. Now, we are an ant trapped under a horse's hoof. We can't move. We are as dead men. Now comes the hard work. How do we love him? How do we, how do we love him? That's a constant uh, question that I know that we all ask ourselves. And in Francis's life, he was tortured by that. He was tormented by that. And luckily, he was able to put that torment in his works. For us, <laughs> we just have to stumble along and love him the best that we can. Saying that, I think when I went to India the first time in January of 1973, going with the Australian group, including Francis, uh, and going to Maya Baba's tomb and meeting the Mandali was really the highlight of my life. And <clears throat> I remember saying to Mani, feeling, feeling so unworthy that I have heard about Baba, but I missed him. He was just here two years ago, and I missed him. And Mani would say, ah, but you are the jewels that Baba promised would come to us. You are, you are his precious jewels. The ones will come and, and know of him. And it, it happened wave after wave of all of us young people. We had all had the same story, slightly different, but the same. We were seeking, we were seeking. We did this, we did that. We dabbled in this, we dabbled in that. But for him to find us in this life, what a blessing, how wonderful. We're so lucky. So that unworthiness, um, the Mandali made me see that unworthiness, it's, it's just an ego thing. Baba finds us because we've put, in, we've put in the time, we've put in those billion years, those billion, billion lifetimes of seeking and searching and we found him, and now the job is to continue to love him. I think 
I think for all of us that is, that, that's the hard part, um, to go on and on with our lives having this secret that not many know. There is God out there and he's there for everybody and only the few will know and know his love. <sighs> um, so that is the beginning and the end. Here at Avatar's abode, in those days, it was incredibly rural. It was a pineapple farm. There were still pineapples here. There was bush up until just behind Barbara's house, which we're now sitting in. All we knew, we would come, we would enter Avatar's abode and the old road, we call it now the old road, it was the, the road then, which Barbara came on to enter Avatar's abode. Francis lived here and worked here and that was the focus of coming to Avatar's abode and uh, being, being with Francis. There's more stories, um, if anyone is interested, myself and Rainey Eastman Gannett did a video and told stories of those early years of being with Francis. So that is available on Michael LePage's YouTube channel, which you can all access at another time. So I won't tell any of those stories. I'll tell more, a um, couple of more personal stories. Um, I remember um, I was agonizing over God knows what at, at a certain time of what am I going to do about this and I can't wait till I get older Francis when all of my worry will be over because I'll be older and I, I'll be younger and I'll be uh, I mean I'll be older I'll be wiser I'll have all of this wisdom to be able to to know what to do in my life and Francis laughed and laughed and laughed, mm -hmm. thought that was the funniest thing, thinking that if you, as you get older, life was going to get easier with the avatar. Uh-uh, no. And of course, now that I'm older, I see that. There's just different kinds of suffering. <laughs> That's all. More suffering in a different way. Uh, Francis really taught me how to love God by his example. Uh, his example of the humility, the way he treated people, um, the way he just was with his life. Um, so obviously he was a huge influence on my life and continues to be with his writings and works. Um, I treasure those days, I treasure those times. Um, the times in India with the Mandali were also very, very precious and also shaped my life with Maya Baba. I can't say that there was a lightning bolt that came down to me that said, aha, he's God. It was just a gradual awakening in my heart and mind where the realization came, well, of course he is. How could he be not? And that that has stayed with me and um, as I'll say again and again, I'm forever grateful to Maya Baba for him um, allowing me to follow him in this life. Uh, a memory comes up of going into Baba's room, which I'm looking at right now, and uh, kneeling down and in the early days you could put your head on Barbara's sandals, they weren't in a box, <laughs> nothing was in boxes, nothing was under glass and everything was there and we could bow down to his sandals and his feet and I remember bowing down and, and something caught my eye and to the right under the chair that Barbara sat on I saw Barbara crouching down going shh it was very playful and it was wonderful. It was like saying, I'm really here, but don't tell anybody. It's our secret. <laughs> so that was, that was a, a, a delightful memory. And um, <clears throat> I wish I could say I had lots of other dreams. I've had dreams with Baba in them, uh, but nothing that I can really recall. But that was a, a particular memory that brings joy when I recall it.
at this time. There's also been times when I've heard Baba's voice, well, a voice, very distinctly and clearly, and I recognize that as the voice of intuition, voice of God, voice of Baba. Uh, very personal things that I really don't want to, to divulge, but just I'm sure that we've all had those things in our life where something has become so crystal clear when you've been agonizing about a decision or being worried about something and you just give it to Baba and crystal clear. It may not come immediately. It may not, it'll come perhaps when you least expected there'll be this voice of sanity and reasons like, aha, of course, that's what I have to do. And I know that that's Baba's voice. No doubt, no doubt. He, he has cast his net and got those pearls that he wanted, the precious jewels. And I don't think of myself as a precious jewel, and I'm sure nobody else does either. <laughs> but what we were, were, were jewels to put on his crown. Yeah. Just adding, adding to, yeah. to, to his crown. And, and um, every, I think people my age and a little younger will, will say the same thing, the search. The, and the and the, the the beauty of the finding and the, and that that feeling like you're connected because we are we are connected by our connection with Maya Baba yeah <clears throat> so that that net feeling of him casting his net and getting the right fish there we are the fish <laughs> caught caught in the net <laughs> the ant under the horse's hoof. The ant under the horse's hoof. You're trapped. You're not going anywhere. Even if you want to. God, how many times have we wanted to not hear this name of Maya Baba? Just to, just to escape from it. You can't. You can't. You might think you have. You might think you go away for years. He'll find you. You'll come back. Because it's the truth. It's in your heart. You can't escape. Oh. Yes. Avoidance. Yeah. You can't avoid. Yeah, the, the, the void that you're going to. Oh, the void. <laughs> the avoidance of the, in the void. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to go back to that void. Yeah, if you remember what it was like, that, that ache of the soul, that ache of, uh, of wanting to find the truth, wanting to find something that is bigger than us, that we can believe in that's truth. And when you recognize it, you know. You know that it's truth. Yeah. Nothing else to say. Many stories. Um, the women in those early days were incredibly beautiful. They were stunning, stunning women. Um, <clears throat> and as I said, they were also young at that time. I think Meru May was, I think, only about 42 in the, in the 70s. And you couldn't imagine, you couldn't imagine yourself, imagine yourself getting old, let alone the Mundali. <laughs> and we would sit, the women would sit on the porch with Mayra and Mani would be sitting next to her and, and Mayru and, and all the other women would be there and Mayra would regale us with stories of times with Baba. And they were, they were very precious times can hear her voice and for her Baba was there. Baba was there. She could recall his voice and she would close her eyes and describe, say Baba was very, very beautiful. His beautiful eyes, his his face, his his hair would come and she would describe in detail the way the little curls were on his on his cheeks from his hair, his beauty when he walked, when when she would watch him work walking the first time she saw him with her mother in the ashram at Upasni Maharaja's ashram and, and <clears throat> seeing the young Merwan and seeing him walk and the beauty of his walk, the, the, the gorgeousness of that walk. So there's, and, and these have all been recorded, her, her stories um, and how we would just be there taking in these stories from, from Mera 
In those days, it was like, oh gosh, will I go to Mundley Hall and listen to Eric, or will I go to the porch and listen to Mayra? It was, oh boy, I mean, they were just rich times. And <laughs> it really was like that, oh, I don't know, it'll be lunchtime soon, is there time to go to... <laughs> <laughs> Goodness, you think about that now. If only I could have those times back. Oh boy. Uh, so, Erich, I remember one time being in Mundley Hall, and of course there, there wasn't just Westerners, there was many Indians that would come. And there was a little man that came, and I don't know what language, what Indian language he was speaking, but Erich could understand him and was interpreting for us what this little man said. And uh, Erich was amazed and, and when he was listening to this, he was, he was exclaiming and going, is this possible, you know, like, like this. And then after this man had finished, Erich turned to all of us who were sitting in Mundley Hall and said, do you know what this man just told me? He told me that he would attend the, ma he attended a mass darshan with Baba in Amanaga at Wadia Park, which was uh, in Amanaga, near the center in Amanaga, where Baba would give many darshans, thousands and thousands of people. And you see Baba in those films sitting there giving darshan and, uh, and, and giving the people, it could be um, a sweet, it could be uh, a banana, it could be something, something else, some, Little, little token from the master and he, he, Erich said that that's, this little man was very very poor and he went with his family to take Maya Baba's darshan and Baba was giving people at that time fruit and you see Baba giving bananas that man said when he opened his hand there was rupees in it. <laughs> and Erich said, Erich was amazed. He said, I lived with this man for years and I still don't know his ways. Isn't that beautiful? It's just so beautiful. When one day the master looked at me sideways, I saw compassion and mercy and forgiveness and oh, so much more. This is why I joined these scoundrels who hang around outside his door with the hope sometimes of seeing him, just that and no more. Of course, one day he might ask me to come in and sweep the floor or go on an errand that indeed would be heaven and more. We do not blame you who give us a wide berth. We deplore our own condition, a grain of love to give him, no more. Oh, that we had great wealth or talent or learning stone to give him fit comforts, to entertain him and much more. But ah, Last night when the street was quiet and sleep totaled each score, he brought us in and gave us such wine, we desire nothing more. Now we are dead men, dead men with our eye fixed on his door and hands held out grasping glasses that he might fill once more. Dead men, we're all dead. <laughs> we're gone. <laughs> I, think, I think what he does, he comes to each of us in the way that our personalities and our beings will accept. For me, I, I'm, I'm a very critical thinker. So I needed to have that time to think very critically about what I was reading and what I was taking in. Where other people, it just takes a dream and they know other people may get hit on the head with God speaks and they know. But for me, <clears throat> it was more 
as I said, more critical thinking. I had to do a lot of thinking before it just accepted, my soul just accepted the fact that Maya Baba is God. And I know that everybody has a different way of coming to him. Yeah. I think we went to Mayrazad. I think we made a Mayrazad, yeah, because we, yes, we did, to meet the Mandali. Yes, Francis was with us. So we went to Mayrazad, and now that you say that, I remember going in the bus from Amanaga to, to Mayrabad and having this feeling of excitement going to the tomb going to the Samadhi of Maya Baba. I didn't know what that was going to be like. And that the Samadhi wasn't as beautiful looking as it is now with its lovely golden dome shining in the sun. It was more, uh, more simple. It was still beautiful, shining in the sun. Um, and bowing down to to the tomb, that was very foreign. Westerners, we don't bow down. We don't bow down to anything. Um, but it felt natural. It didn't feel self-conscious. Maybe it did at first. Maybe the first time I bowed down, it felt self-conscious. But after that, not at all. Not at all. Um, yeah, so having Francis on that first trip with us made a difference going to Mayrazad and they were welcoming one of their brothers home. So that was, that was really special to see how he, he was loved by the other Mandali residents. And then he, he was bringing us, us, these young, young people, and um, meeting Mayra for the first time. Uh, we we, didn't, we weren't told until later that we had to cover our, our cells. Women, uh, women, girls at that time, you had to be really careful about covering yourself up, covering your arms, covering your legs, because it was, uh, how would you say, it just wasn't in the Indian custom. Women and girls covered themselves up, so it would look very... Um, Inappropriate, thank you. Inappropriate if we were half undressed. And coming from Australia, which is hot, it was, it was summertime coming from Australia. So I met, this is so, like, I just die when I think about this now. I met Mayra in a sarong, just tied in the front. I have pictures of it to prove it. Long hair, just a sarong tied in the front. Here I am accepting Prasad from Papa's beautiful Mayra. <laughs> but that was the thing about the Mandali, they didn't judge. They, they absolutely had no judging about who you were, where you came from. You were here, you were in India, you got to India, you got to be at Baba's place. So Baba brought you there, doesn't matter what you look like, who you were, not at all, didn't matter. We were told discreetly later on to cover up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were, we were barbers. <laughs> Erich would roll his eyes. Oh. And uh, Padre, he would call us all savages. Yeah. Yeah, the savage. <laughs> yeah. It must have been very, very, um, very strange for them very, to see all of a sudden, after only a couple of years after Baba's dropping the body, all of these Westerners descending upon, upon them with their stupid questions over and over and over again. And our clothing, our dress, our ways, our manners must have, the, 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 the patience they had to endure us was Amazing, just shows you that they were May Papa's Mundali, blessed. I, I, I don't want to use that word because they weren't blessed. They also earned what they had from millions and millions of years. We all did, everyone who follows Maya Baba. We're not blessed. We're not blessed at all. We, we earned it 
through millions of years of suffering and pain and God knows what to get to him. So never call yourself blessed. You're not. You earned it. It doesn't mean that you're going to get off lightly once you've found him. That's when the suffering begins. So but also the beauty. <laughs> what? So why not turn up in the sarong? <laughs> Didn't know any different. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, well, Extraordinary Women comes to mind Phyllis Fredericks, who was extraordinary. Um, the man I married, Harold Jameson, w w lived in LA for a long time and knew Phyllis quite well. So when we were engaged, uh, Phyllis happened to be in uh, Oakland, California. And I remember her saying, oh, I see, I, see, I see twinkling lights above you, above both of us. And they were fairies. They were the fairies, I knew. <laughs> fairies never left me. They still haven't. Um, and Phyllis was another one of those extraordinary, uh, I'd say women, but not only women, but men, who when they had the conviction that Maya Baba is in, in the world, in their life, you can, the storm can hit you, the hail can hit you, everything can hit you. And the poise and the beauty that Phyllis had, she wasn't a beautiful person, looking person in the in the conventional sense of the word but she had the poise and beauty of someone who knew who they really were and I think that you could say the same about Kitty Davy, um, about Margaret Krask, of Elizabeth Patterson, um, all of those extraordinary people that met Baba and the poise and the beauty they had stays with me and I would like to think that there's some little little emanation from me that that I can beam out to people because people do get attracted to you because because of Baba they do and when I say attract they, they, they know that there's something slightly a little different about you, but they can't put their finger on it. And so the women, so I was lucky enough to get to know Phyllis uh, and Kitty, to know Kitty and Margaret and, and Elizabeth Patterson. Um, not in a really deep way, but enough to, to meet them and have conversations with them to know who I was, which was nice. Our house in California, we were lucky enough to host Darwin, Darwin Shaw, Darwin and Jeannie Shaw at our house. And a lot of the Mandalay, and I'll, I'll, we'll tell you a funny story about Alabar visiting the Bay Area of, of um, California, the San Francisco Bay Area where I lived. Um, he was, uh, the plan was for him to stay at Louise, Barry and Dick Anthony's house and Louise had found out what his favourite photograph of Barbara was, she had found it, she had bought it, she had it framed specially and put it in the room that he was going to stay in and when he travelled up and saw the room he just said, I will not stay here and for some reason they came to to my house, um, he and Louise and the Persian girl that was accompanying him, uh, Shahnaz. And I was um, eight months pregnant at that time, not really giving a damn about what my house looked like or anything else. And I was downstairs playing with my son and I hear voices in my bedroom upstairs and I picked him up, we walked inside, I walked up the stairs and into my bedroom and here's Alabar, one of Maya Baba's Mandali, in my bedroom. The bed was unmade, there was <clears throat> clothes all over the floor. I was shocked, horrified, delighted. 
everything went over my face. And my friend Louise, it is still a bond we have to this day, we can recall. She said, you should have seen your face. <laughs> and Alaba said, I will stay here. And I'm just, you know, what can you say? I remember nodding dumbly, mm-hmm. <laughs> walking out <laughs> and uh, anyhow the upshot of it was that he didn't end up staying at my house he didn't end up staying at the Anthony Barry's and that was fine but that is such a, a great story because to that to this day I still make my bed no matter what I have to do during the day, whatever the time is, because one never knows when a mandali might show up in your bedroom. <laughs> so that, that was a, a, a very interesting story. And Bao, when Bao was doing his world travels, he also was at our house. We hosted Bao, Darwin and Jeannie Shaw, Phyllis was at our house. Um, uh, Charles Haynes stayed at our house. Many, many, many monthly hostings. May Rue came to our house. Um, <clears throat> many, many um, hostings. Anyhow, my time in America, 38 years, was uh, a time that Baba carved out for me to raise my children and have a, 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 a happy relationship, marriage, until it wasn't. And then he brought me back to Australia and ready for the next phase of my life, which is yet to be revealed, or perhaps this is it. <laughs> my life with Baba today is more of a companion, um, a close companion, and knowing he is always with me, and just waiting for him to reveal to me the next phase of my life because we know that there's always more. Um, all I can say is that this phase of my life is more, more the absolute certainty and the companionship with him. Where previously I had the certainty but I didn't have the time to have that real deep companionship. It was always taking care of children, dogs, people, and whatever needed to be done. Um, but this phase of my life seems that it will be, so far, uh, more of a deeper companionship with him. So I can say. I remember walking around the garden with Mayra um, and her pointing out Baba's tree and Baba was so beautiful and Baba loved this flower, Baba did this, Baba did that and talking very intimately with her. Um, there were some things that she said to me which I really don't want don't to tell but it was just say it was a very intimate conversation um, and also when uh, when I was in the United States and was trying to have a baby Mayra and the other women were intimately involved not in the way that you think uh, in in the conception of my first child uh, Mayra sent me from India a rose and a prayer with the instructions that I was to eat the entire rose and say this particular prayer, which I did. Go down, you know, the stem, everything. Uh, I mean, why, why wouldn't I? <laughs> and uh, Goa also, Dr. Goher, which was Baba's doctor, one of the Mandali women also sent Ayurvedic herbs and much encouragement and uh, assurance that there was that soul there. And that 
ended being, up being my son Luke, Luke Muwan Jameson. Um, and that was, that's really, really special. It was really special. And of course, the, the women monthly were, they love it. They, they love knowing that Baba bees have come into the world and they've had a part in it. They were very, very happy and were very involved. I, I've kept many, all, all the letters that they wrote at that time during, before, during and after, uh, after meeting Harold and, and their happiness and then all through pregnancies and, and children being born, just their, their greetings and their love, just so special, so really, really special, yeah. Money, money always said the right thing at the right time with everybody. I think all of us have had that, that experience. Um, I remember asking money when I had been there about a month and I got notice that the job that I had back in Australia, that they had given that job to somebody else and which freed me to live in India or I could go back and to Australia and get another job. And I remember going to Mani and saying, should I stay? Should I live here? Should I live here? I remember her looking at me very intensely and telling me that I should go back to Australia. And I realized now I wasn't cut out to live in India like some of my friends have ended up doing. I wasn't cut out to do that. If, if, if um, money had said stay, I probably would still be there living in India. But she knew, she knew that, that I wasn't cut out to live that life. The, the, re, the Westerners, the resident West, re, Western residents live, have lived in India. Obviously she knew something that I didn't know. Yeah, did that, did that quite a number of times at Lower Mayrabad. You mean staying at Lower Mayrabad down there? <clears throat> stay at Lower Mayrabad, but when, in the early days we would stay at Mayor Colony. Uh, and that was pretty rural, that was pretty, pretty rural. Had have the, the cook crouching by the fire making our food and we would sit around the fire and, and eat the food. Yeah, but going to Mayrabad, going to Lower Mayrabad was, was definitely a, um, a, a treat and having to eat all of the food on your plate. That's one thing that Padre absolutely insisted that you had to eat all the food on your plate. Mister, eat it all. Baba would not like you to leave it. And we had to eat it all. And they were, they were great times because you really had a lot of fun. We were all single, we were all just fun. Everybody was just on a honeymoon with Baba. We were as high as kites. Who needed drugs, you know? We were just high on his love. So it was absolutely wonderful being in India in those early 70 days, all through the 70s and into the early 80s. Yeah. <laughs> so I have a story about Pop's house in Amanaga. Um, Pat Sumner was living there at the time. And Pat Sumner originally is from Australia. She's now a resident in India, has been for many, many years. <clears throat> and I'm a friend of Pat's. And I got very, very sick. It was the birthday play. It must have, it was uh, Bar Barbara's birthday play, maybe 1974 or 1975. I, I can't recall the, the year now. And had done extensive rehearsals on this play. And it was gonna be so great. And just before the play, I got very sick, extremely sick, uh, dysentery, just I lost a lot of weight immediately. And Pat decided that I should come and stay with her at Pop's house, which is on the way to Mayrazad, uh, in Armanaga, but outside Armanaga town. And I was quite ill. Um, and on the day of the play, the women Mundali were, dry, were being driven out to Mayrazad to see the play and they stopped 
in to visit me to see how I was at Pop's house. And before they had come that night or day, the days and nights kind of blended in because I was really quite deliriously ill. I had a vision of Ganesh and I don't know whether it was a, 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 in my mind, whether it really actually was a vision, I think it was a vision of them appearing. It was Ganesh coming through the, the walls, big dad Ganesh, little mother Ganesh and little baby. And Ganesh said to me, ask me anything that you have ever wanted to know about the universe, anything you want to know. <laughs> and I said, looking at the baby, how long does it take the baby's ears to grow to full length? It's <laughs> a very deep question. <laughs> and when the Mandali came, I, I visited with them and I'm not sure if I mentioned it to them then or at a later date, this vision that I'd had. And Mani said to me that it was a very spiritual thing to have happened and that I was very fortunate to have this vision. And, um, and I was lucky. But now I go, oh my God. God, I asked how, how long did it take for the baby's ears to grow? I could have asked any question of the universe. Did you get an answer? <laughs> that though? was the important question. <laughs> the important question. He did, he, did, he did answer me, but what he answered has been lost in time. I think he said something like 12 months or something. The point is, I asked a stupid question. <laughs> So I'm obviously not ready for prime time yet with the avatar. <laughs> but that was a great memory. The, the Mandalay in those days, were, we were their family. We still are their family. But because there was so few of us, they really, really, they knew everything about us. And they treated us like family. And that was so special, so special.